On the morning of March 2nd, 1998, I woke up inside of a completely pitch black space with a serious problem. I was not breathing. I had no idea where I was. I couldn't see a thing. And all I heard was the terrified voice in my head as I desperately tried in vain to draw one single breath. I've been preparing to give this talk for just about two decades, and this is the first time I'm delivering it to a live audience. Good odds, I'll be moved to tears at some point. But make no mistake, any tears that I may shed here today are ones of utter joy and bliss-filled gratitude. Joy and gratitude to be here with all of you. Joy and gratitude to simply be. Joy and gratitude to still be able to simply do this. What I have to share with you today could save your life or the life of someone you love. Thank you for being here and thank you for your attention. Imagine it's the middle of May of your senior year and you are sitting inside the Joy Center listening to Tom Brokaw deliver your commencement address. You earned your Bachelor of Arts with a double major in just seven semesters thanks to a couple dozen credits from AP tests that you took in high school. You made the Dean's List seven out of seven semesters before graduating magna cum laude. And just yesterday, you were inducted into the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. You started a corporate IT job a couple of months ago, but of course you arranged for time off to spend senior week here in South Bend with your best friends and favorite people on earth and what a wonderful week it has been. But the official end of your run as an undergrad here in the shadow of the dome is imminent as Mr. Brokaw pauses momentarily, telegraphing he's about to end his speech, then says, quote, on these occasions, I simply like to remind young people we need your help. And remember, it's easy to make a buck. It's tougher to make a difference. Go Irish, end quote. You're only 22 years old, but you've already learned enough, even though a lot of that has come from movies, to know that Mr. Brokaw is right. You get how energizing it can feel to work in service of principles that inspire you. You understand how wonderful it is to do good. You have no doubt that you will use your education and your many other advantages to make a difference for others with less good fortune than you. But that is not your priority at the moment. Instead, you're compelled to do that which you believe will bring your parents, especially your father, the greatest amount of joy, pride, and satisfaction. They're both high school graduates that worked very hard to pay for your high quality education, stretching all the way back to fourth grade and up and through your time here. They didn't go to college, but they made damn sure that you did. You feel a duty to honor them by succeeding. You feel a duty to do well. What's the difference in the world that you're focused on making right now? That's easy. It's whatever your boss at work says it is. Plus, you don't really know what change you wish to be in the world yet. You're only 22. During your time here in South Bend, your priority was achieving academic excellence. Post-college right now, your priority is achieving professional excellence. That's what's next. Fast forward five years. At 27 years old, you are the youngest principal in the corporate banking division of an IT consultancy located a couple of blocks from Wall Street. Your bill rate is 250 bucks an hour. You spent the majority of the last two years living in Zurich and Toronto, working on software projects at big banks, but you're stateside again now, working out of your firm's downtown office. Your office on the 39th floor of One Chase Plaza has a view of Lady Liberty herself. You live alone in a studio in the West Village and you've just submitted business school apps to Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Northwestern, and UCLA. That's what's next. Of course, the you I'm referring to is actually me. I graduated from Notre Dame in 93 after three years in Zom and that last semester off campus in a house downtown on Navarre Street. Five years later, in New York City, I am crushing it professionally, like I did academically. The details of my particular story aside, how different are we, really? How well did you do in high school? How well are you doing now? How important is doing well to you? What are you focused on? How do you measure yourself? 
do you know the change that you wish to be in the world? What are you going to do after college? Back to 1998, it's Sunday, March 1st, eight o'clock in the morning, and I'm lying on my back on a futon bed, staring up at the ceiling in my apartment in the village. If I slept at all last night, it was for 20, 30 minutes tops, about eight hours ago. For the last three months, I've slept between zero and three hours a night at most. It has become apparent that my inability to sleep has put achieving excellence in the future in any endeavor beyond my reach. I don't think it's going to happen, but my priority today is to see if I'm capable of summoning the courage to end my life. 24 hours later, a warehouse manager named Norman, arriving at work in Secaucus, finds me unconscious with a large bump on my head inside of a running rental car that I've turned into a makeshift carbon monoxide gas chamber. In the ambulance, on the way to the hospital, I stop breathing and have what is commonly referred to as a near-death experience. I survive, and after a couple of days in a coma, I wake up in the intensive care unit at the Jersey City Medical Center. I am here today to be a lighthouse for all of you. I'm here to shine a light on the particular rocks that I crashed into when I was 27 years old. Surviving and eventually thriving after my suicidal crisis has been a long journey laden with life-preserving and life-affirming lessons. I'm here today to share those lessons with you. There were times when I used to run There were times when I was too scared to stand for what I need 